I appreciate that uh, many of our members are, are in a, a jet lag state, and I, I've lived the life of jet lag, having worked for the Commonwealth Learning for a few years. And in my own pers personal experience, a jet lag is not something I could uh, find a remedy for, so I just learned to live with it. Um, but we do appreciate it. The good news is um, we, the next session uh, will finish as soon as you actually want it to finish once we get to the discussion, the discussion part. But this is an important point which provides conceptual building blocks uh, for many components of the OEO University model, which we're actually going to be sorting out tomorrow. So th these are the building blocks for t tomorrow's session. So I'm, get, I'm going to hand over to, to Jim, who will be talking about uh, open pedagogy. Uh, and to help inform what we're going to be uh, doing tomorrow. So, Jim, thank you very much. Yeah. I'll just clarify, I don't know if I've got Jack Lager away now, but um, <laughs> I'll be talking about pedagogy to begin with, and uh, then there'll be a second presentation on the prototype. So this is the pedagogy, um, which follows on from our brief discussion this morning, and then setting up the work for tomorrow will be another short presentation on the OER prototype parameter, so just get moving with this. Um, we realise that we've got a whole lot of complexity that we've talked around today. And this is a model that looks at sustainability. Um, I've put right at the centre of that, the fact that we need effective learning environments. As we know, we've got lots of challenges with technology, economics, culture, organisation, all of those issues. But unless we get an effective learning environment, then I think pedagogy or the transmission model of learning. We move in with new technology but we tend to stay with the, the same pedagogy and I refer to that as the tyranny of proximity. It's overlooked. Nobody really questions face-to-face -face teaching in any meaningful way on a wide scale. So having a look at that and if we look at our opportunity for innovative learning environments what we've got is the opportunity for technological innovation. So we're moving towards the high end of that with Wiggy's blog, some of the things that we're doing today. But if we think about pedagogical innovation, a lot of institutions still have old objectives and traditional methods, even though they're using some new technologies. So if we start with traditional technologies and and traditional methods, what often happens is that we move along the top end of the scale there and we start applying new technologies that stay in the same pedagogy. Now, I'm not against that if that's what people want to do. And I, I don't question Rory's concern about not wanting to have a debate. But I think there are opportunities to explore uh, pedagogical innovation alongside technological innovation. So my point is, can we get to new objectives and new methods and new technologies? You know, can we get into that space? Are we serving our students well if we can? So you may realise I've got a pretty jaundiced view about conventional pedagogy. We often refer to it as feeding the chooks. Uh, in, in Australia. And the other thing is that I don't think the Chooks are too impressed about this uh, approach very often. So we came up with the idea of free range learning, which is a, a, a pedagogy based on exploring all of the richness of open educational resources, but having the students actually find the resources and evaluate them and so on. So we get organic students in a sense. And um, just to highlight that, I think the students are revolting. I mean, we know that anyway, but the students are revolting against old technologies. Um, earlier this year, I was invited to speak to the continuing practicing accountants who have an international forum on um, educational transformation. 
Um, a senior person from one of the major universities in Sydney said that some of his staff were applying for stress leave because they had 300 first year students in an accounting lecture and none of them were interested. They were all texting and surfing and you know, having Twitter sessions amongst themselves. And the staff just couldn't talk and they didn't know what to do about it. So I'm not just saying this as a, a proposing a new pedagogy, but I think how do we put our students at the center of the world that they're going to live in and work in? So I see this, these opportunities here that we've got all the communications, the e-portfolios, collaboration groups inside and outside the university, professional networks, social networks, and I've added in OER repositories down here. So how do we best get our students working in this environment um, to develop the skills? So one of the things we started with was the view that there was a critical mass of open educational resources available now for most disciplines. I highlighted Noodle tools there because these aggregation sites are here to help our students find information. Now, I'm not going to go through this, but I'd encourage you to have a look at it if you're not familiar with it. And it goes on and on and on. And all of these sites are cascading into areas that are really interesting and useful where a lot of qualification of the, the quality of materials that are available in here and access to current newspapers, everything is in here. And that's just one example of a site that I think lays the foundation for the pedagogy of discovery. As well as here, I've got sites that go open, content, textbooks, open access journals. I need to open them for this audience. But there is now a critical mass of materials. I think it's entirely feasible to design courses based solely on OER, which is one of our principles. There are opportunities for pedagogical innovation. Not everyone might take them, but they are there. But when we design pedagogical innovation, up, I think we've got to also consider scalability, sustainability, and adaptability. Now, I don't think necessarily a traditional uh, pedagogy ever considered those issues too much. So I think we need a, a new mindset about urban pedagogy. But I acknowledge there will be multiple versions of urban pedagogy. So I'm going to show you one example. And I acknowledge and I'm happy with whatever else anyone decides to do in principle. So we're trying to get our students, instead of spoon feeding them content, is to get online using search engines and the like and discover, evaluate and share. We hope to support that with well-trained volunteers, which we'll come to in the next session. And Part of the heart of this is to develop digital learning literacies necessary to support self-directed learning. So this is solely online and it's the sort of things we do when we start doing research. Now, I've got a handout at the end of the session for the learning literacies for a digital age, which is a really neat summary with a lot of good scholarship behind it. And I've talked here about embedding digital learning literacies in the curriculum. And one of the courses that some of David Bull's staff are working on with me is e-literacy for contemporary society. It's providing the skills, the opportunity to develop skills that will enable people to work in the current digital environment and OERs. Now, I've put a link in there, but the, the learning literacies that are uh, documented there uh, based on a study that was done in Glasgow and I'm just going to show you the framework um, that I'm going to hand out. So at the top level it looks at basic framing ideas, we talked about metacognition briefly this morning and then competencies, practices, what competent learners do and then digital practices, so what competent digital the enable learners do. Now, there's a whole string of examples and a big study there 
with a lot of um, references if you want to follow up. So it's a really nice summary. And what we decided was that we try to embed that into the actual curriculum. So we started developing this course. The other thing that underpins our work is Jilly Salmon's um, five-stage model, which some of you would be familiar with, on productive learning forums. So we try to <coughs> embed this sort of pedagogical base in starting at the bottom and building up towards information exchange, knowledge construction. <coughs> and the amount of interaction varies. So in the beginning, we just want to get people started, get them motivated, let them feel confident. And then we move them towards sharing. So we've tried to integrate learning literacies with a new model for generating you know, productive learning forums online because we want collaboration and we want people working together. And that was just the model. We had a workshop earlier in this year at USQ and at USQ where we examined this. Now, that's embedding learning literacies into the curriculum, which I think we should do. The other way of tackling it is embedding learning literacies into the pedagogy in a particular course. And we're <coughs> also working on a model for that. For this um, foundation course of regional relations in the Asia Pacific, I might just take a, a couple of minutes to just give you a feel for that. It's, it's put up in Moodle. Uh, sorry, it's lost me. I'll go back. Um, it'll only take a minute to get it out. But if there's time and if you've got enough energy, I was just going to give you a sense of what it might look like online. But I'll, I'll have to log in. It's closing the game. So it'll only take a second. <coughs> so this gets in, gets into our Moodle environment and this is a course um, sort of set up to contribute and one of the ideas that we have is a series of activities in here which embed the curriculum so Students are actively searching for content around these issues. So historical overviews, diversity of human ideas, and so on. And at the end, we get a, a sense of direction there. They're based around activities, which is Julie Simon's term for e-learning activity. And this just highlights, again, briefly the structure of what they get here. So they get a stimulus, which might be an OER, a purpose, a task guidelines, and a response, and so on. And we ask them to load information on this into a regional relations database. So what we're trying to do is get the students to identify content of relevant interest. And then as part of the uh, work that they do, they can actually add this. Now this is using a database module and it's just an example, but all the students would have to do is add an entry and all they're doing is they're selecting the country they're working on, they put in the URL and comment, so it's like an annotated bibliography that all students can access for their work. We're trying to embed that you know, within Google. So that's just an example of embedding a pedagogy into a particular approach. And um, my last slide, although probably very briefly, is that we've, we've got to do all of these things and it's not simple. I think we know that the concept is simple, the operation is challenging, but I think we really do need, I'm putting in a pitch here for some innovative learning environments using open pedagogy and enabling our students to operate in that space. So that's my brief introduction. Thanks. That database, John, is it? Um, that's a separate database. It's not part of your Moodle. No, it's it's in Moodle. What what we're trying to do is work everything in Moodle. So as well as the database, we've got reviews, research uh, processes using modules within Moodle 
And we've also uh, working on an e-portfolio because part of the assessment is that as the students work through the activities, they're going to be asking them to keep a record of their contribution in their own personal wiki. Now, the idea of a personal wiki is kind of intuitive in a sense, but that's going to be their e-portfolio, and that will be part of the assessment at the end of the semester. So they'll have their own personal wiki, which acts as a portfolio, and then they'll have the regional, the group database, uh, which acts as um, a resource. And each cohort that we see moving through, we'll leave that behind. You know, we're not going to use it again because the OER resources will be different. The way the structure is designed also gives a, a freedom of choice for students, a personalization. So we're actually getting them to define what is Asia and the Pacific, and they're able to choose the country that interests them in the activities. So we're not getting everyone to chew over the same content, but the principles are the same. So that's an example of an open pedagogy uh, where students are discovering and evaluating the content. And what we believe is that it will help them build the learning literacies, and I'll just pass that around there. We think that we can help them build these um, you know, by operating with that pedagogy. So, thank you. The, the, the all questions continue reflecting, clarifying with, with Joan, and I'll just get set up to show you one or two things uh, for the next 10 minutes, um, which relates to technology. Um, so, I might just make one comment while Wayne's doing that. Um, I think the resource that we put into this is to try and come up with the two or three courses that we may be able to offer into the structure, you know, if there's enough interest. So the, the e-literacy for contemporary society is one of them, and the regional relations, which is about international relations in general, is another, and I'm working, they're both from the Faculty of Arts, and I'm working on another course on organisational behaviour, which is an introductory course in the Bachelor of Business degree. They would all fit into the Diploma of Arts or Bachelor of General Studies within our structure, um, but it does take some resource. I mean, to, I've got interested staff members working with me, um, and I'm not trying to persuade everyone, you know, I'm an E3. Both the Dean of Business and the Dean of Arts support what we're doing. And so within existing institutional process, I'm not fighting a major battle. So that's, again, just some of the complexities of actually doing this sort of thing. So, um, I mean, we've got the same issue interest in, in doing this. In fact, my, my um, area of research is role-based learning, as you know, so doing role plays all around the world. And the issue of scalability and sustainability, but also the issue of um, time. So are we, when we say open educational resources, normally we mean any time, any place, but with this kind of um, pedagogy we talk about cohorts, which means that time isn't as open um, as you would normally think about in distance education. So it's a cohort base. You need a cohort before you can start the course. But I'm not talking against it, I'm just saying we haven't written that anywhere as a perhaps a principle that needs to be discussed because I would prefer that approach. Which I think, I think is a very good question. And so what gets interesting with this model is it kind of becomes the economics of education. Because mm. you think of this on a mass planetary scale, um, you would have a continuous cohort. Um, with learners coming in and out of times that suit them. So it, it gets, so it's another way of innovating around the pedagogy, which uh, still has a lot of the openness and freedom that we, we, we brought into sort of the traditional money model of greater autonomy for learners. Um, but when you ramp and scale this on a plan, it, it gets very interesting. Yeah, so the other, the other notion is that you can enrol as many people as you want to if it's just content that you're putting up. Once you start running around cohort, a pedagogy based around cohort communication collaboration, you set limits to group size, you set limits to the time it will run, 
um, because you need lower wages and so on, which is not unachievable, it just is a different um, model that has to be worked out. And the, the next presentation and uh, the next session is partly addressing that, but um, what we were trying to do is we talked about originally in the paper Parallel Universe in the first paper that I wrote. So what we were trying to do was prepare students who might well transition into the mainstream university who tend to work you know, in cohorts, in semester constraints. And that's part of the discipline of working in a university. Uh, so that was one of the guiding principles. But as Wayne pointed out, we can have a whole series of cohorts because the numbers should be there. The challenge is how we manage the volunteers, which is yes. you know, what I'm talking about in the session. Well, I think it takes a lot of skill to run things like this. So. Yeah. I suppose I'm saying that we should be setting our sights yeah. you know, as high as we can cope with and where the interest leads us uh, in terms of innovation. Because I think the main thing that started us here was if we put the student at the centre of the OER world, you know, what do they need to develop to survive? Now we could find a whole lot of resources and feed them in a transmission model, and that's fine if that's what people want. Or we can prepare them to have self-directed learning you know, in the digital world. Peer-to-peer learning. Yeah, all of that. Um, so maybe but, but I think are we, we able as a contributing university to say we'll only be running our contributed course once a year at this particular time? Sure. That, that's what I'm really yeah. getting at because it's not scalable necessarily with no. volunteers, some of the models. Yeah, and if absolutely. we want to put forward a best model course, then there will be constraints on the best model course in terms of <coughs> you know, yeah. who's available so to run it. Absolutely, and each institution will have the freedom to do that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and so what also gets interesting on the open category, if, you just, if we think about separating assessment points as, as a kind of format or summative assessment points, if you will, from what happens with the learning sequence, the model can scale because what you can do is you could set four fixed summative assessment points which partners agree with. And you can, so what you basically got, you've got four points in the year that a learner running through any sequence at any speed at any time can actually say, well, I want the January assessment, I want the May assessment, I want the October assessment. See, I'm not sure that works if you are running a pedagogy where the activity is the assessment. I mean, if you're running a But if, model if, if, you keep, if you're tracking the, the assessment as an equal photo. Yes. But if your assessment is participation in building the database or participation in the role yeah, yeah. plan. The assessment isn't building the database. I mean, that's a resource. So I think all these all right. discussions we need to have when we've got more time, and they're all relevant. Yeah. But my basic personal view is there's room for a whole variety. Absolutely. It wasn't a criticism and of the idea. No. It was like, okay, now I have to no. that. And I think the students will benefit from that variety. Mm. Oh. Yeah. We should be setting it aside time, yeah. Mm. Okay. That's all we need. Yeah. Um, Do we see that also as a preparation for higher education? Um, it would seem like some of those could fit in yeah. that area. Well, this is part of the Diploma of Arts program which David Bull's stuff run. So we were trying to provide the foundation for further study in that. And I showed you it embedded in the curriculum, but the e-literacy for contemporary society made the learning that this is a substantive content, so it did it even more, if you like. It was totally focused on that. And, uh, Again, I think in a general degree program, it's a real value. Great. Well, what I want to do here is going to be very quick, and it's, it's really doing some of the boring te technology stuff. Because if you go to function as a network, what we need to be able to have is a, a platform where we can collaboratively, as a network, work on the course development, you know, our courses. These utilities, we need, we need a space collaboratively where we can do that. And there, there are two very funda or two fundamental requirements for that technology, or in fact three. One, it must be cheap, uh, uh, and it mustn't cost the organisations anything, right? And expensive. 
Uh, th thank you. In, in, English professor, inexpensive. Must be inexpensive. Um, two, it must be able to integrate with any of the learning management systems or delivery technologies member partners are using on campus. Right? So that there's no requirement to change your technology on campus. Um, well, just, just a second. Um, there's no requirement to change your technology on campus. It doesn't have to integrate. Oh, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a you just said it must integrate with them, and I don't think it needs to do that. Oh, um, by, by, inter um, by integration, I mean many things um, in terms of tech technology, whether it's interoperability, whether it's not, um, in terms of how you achieve that. So it's kind of a bit of a te technology tip, yeah. And the, the next requirement, certainly from our perspective, if you're doing this on a global scale, it needs to be a technology that can scale well um, in terms of number of users. And the way we are working is we, we use a wiki engine, and this is uh, a wiki which has been strongly supported by the Commonwealth of Learning over the years. It has scaled to 23,000 uh, education and formal education sector. Um, it, is an, it is an expensive, um, you know, to, to, to run. And we've done some experimental work in, and I'm not saying this in pedagogy, but we've done some experimental work with thanks again to funding from UNESCO. I mentioned earlier this morning a pilot to develop a, an online course on open content licensing uh, that could be taught to the world irrespective of how many learners enrolled for that program. Okay, so if there were 10,000 learners, one facilitator should be able to manage the course. Um, and this comes from a little bit of experience in distance education. I started life out as a course coordinator for a course of 12,000 students which we taught with eight faculty. So we, I learned how to scale things. Um, so basically what we did is we said, well, okay, and this is just in a wiki environment. We said, you know, there are a number of course resources, right, which are the course learning materials. Um, there are a number of utilities, if you will, um, that you can work through to get to a certain point. Um, and, you know, you know, we can facilitate this course with oh, 300, uh, or just short of 400, uh, which we ran with uh, three volunteers uh, in, in this particular example. Uh, and how it basically worked was uh, you would appreciate that the traditional discussion forum engine doesn't scale well when you've got hundreds and thousands of learners uh, if you're not grouping them into subgroups because of just the load of getting a thousand welcome emails in your inbox is not the kind of thing that encourages learning. Uh, and also it, it's got a strong input in terms of staff time. So basically what we did is we experimented with, and again, I'm not saying it's a perfect solution, but what we experimented with was a bit of this peer-to-peer -peer stuff. And we just used microblogging as a peer-to-peer -peer support mechanism in this particular example. So there would be utilities within the, uh, the content where the activity was to actually micro microblog about your experience. And so across the time zone, um, you know, you didn't have to be awake 24 hours. And it was peer to peer support of you know, learners across different time zones grappling with the problem. But it was perfectly scalable because we could do this. If we had 10,000 people doing this online course um, with one facilitator, it wouldn't have had any impact on the tuition inputs. So, I mean, that's basically how it works. But what I want to show you is um, so, um, you know, here are the course materials. And, um, the, you know, Not the one I want to actually look at because it's kind of the orientation. So, um, yeah, what can you copy? You need your nice and date, these and stuff. <coughs> oh, I, I, I have to acknowledge my source uh, in terms of open content license. Uh, Professor McGreal developed this uh, subcomponent of the resource on the history of copyright. Um, well, you might want to test this. Um, the origins of plagiarism can be traced to society's moral conviction that it is wrong to copy someone's work. True or false? False. false yeah. yeah, correct. Uh, you know, but, I mean, actually learning is in, in actual fact copying to that <laughs> object So, um, But just an example. <coughs> so, uh, different people from all over the world collaborated on developing this. Rory was involved, Creative Commons International was involved, we were involved here. 
Um, the wiki educator community was involved, all developing different components, right, uh, of, of the course materials. You know, the e, e, well, this is not e activity, but you know, reading resources and all the rest of it. So now the challenge is how you, you've got this, on the one side, this open rack, radical wiki model where people can sort of do whatever they want, and then you have people that actually prefer the structured learning sequences. And so we set up a parallel version uh, running in a Moodle. Now this could be any learning management system, okay? And so let's just look, now I'm sitting within a learning management system environment. Um, let's just find that same resource, uh, the history of copyright, okay? I'm now in the learning management system. Uh, here we go, the connection is, I could have got a script in Google. Should be coming through. Still loading, we've got a reverse load connection. But what will happen now is the, the same resource will be embedded um, in the learning management system that's actually residing on the Wiki Educator platform. So you've got one platform which you can actually then use uh, across multiple delivery resources. Um, and so there's a little bit of intelligence going on here, and Jim is the, the brains behind this. Uh, there's some intelligence which knows, Jim, Jim Titzler, yeah, uh, that knows, okay, this is being delivered to a learning management system. Take all the redundant navigation that you typically find in the wiki out. And don't use it for this delivery. So this gets interesting, right? Um, what you can also do with the weekend environment, and you are very sensitive to the challenges of uh, working in an you know, open or an environment where learners may not have 24-7 connectivity. But I could take any resource in the wiki and basically say, yeah, I want, you know, I want to add that to my study guide uh, that we want to include. And you know, this is exceptionally good pedagogy because it's got all the you know, activities and uh, you know, activities and stuff that we need need for this course. I mean, I can add add that to my my study guide. And uh, what we can now do is because we've got we collated this uh, study guide, uh, and we could assume <coughs> that, for example, it's you know USQ that is wanting to distribute the study guide, and we can do that because it's an open license. We can. Um, um, you know, do these sorts of things. And I can say, you know, I, I can tell a wiki educator um, some learners might actually want to go and order the book from a print on demand publisher. Um, so let's try that. And this is just an example of a print on demand publisher um, that provides a service to provide a package study guide. I'm a f for a fee for service basis, I mean, but. Uh, this is what's done. What, uh, what, what color is uh, USQ? Yeah. Yellow. Yellow. All right. So, I mean, for USQ, it must be customized for yellow. <laughs> and we really need to have US, USQ's logo there, right? Um, and so we put on USQ's logo, and uh, what you want to do is you actually want to preview this. And I always can never remember where uh, the preview is. So under the click book, to under the big book. Under the so here yeah, you can you know you can get it you know quick uh, what the uh, online version you wanted to buy this is all free content what it's actually doing it's, it's got some intent it recognizes that the learner may not be online and it'll actually then provide all the dynamic URLs so that when the learner gets to a learning center that they could then go and conduct the utilities. Now, the, what I'm wanting to point out to you, this is not pie in the sky wishful thinking. This is live technology that we've just run now, that is running off a wiki engine. All free software, all free content. And we can use this for the literacy course. Yeah. I'm not consider that, but I'm sure that there's something helpful to you. And, and, and so, and the other example, I won't go into all the details, I just wanted to give you a sense of um, what, what is in fact possible with wiki technology and why it is our, techno our technology of choice. Because you must also remember, because a wiki keeps track of every single edit that is made. And when we are referencing a, a learning resource within the learning management system, we can reference a particular revision instance. 
So what does that mean in practical terms? It means you can use the same technology engine for updating the course for next year's delivery without having an impact on the students for the current course <coughs> using the same technology engine. So just to give it a... a but you only have one instance of it. And you only have one instance of it, yeah. yeah. And so, so this is, and, and the technology that's being used here, it's just a standard HTML iframe tag um, that can embed in any web uh, delivery technology. And that's why we can integrate across multiple platforms. And we don't need all this interoperability scoring packaging stuff uh, because HTML, because it's now openly licensed, we don't have to lock my password. It, it can be reintegrated in these ways. So that's all I wanted to show there. Just you know, give some ideas of, of what, what is possible um, through a collaboration like this. Um, and the last thing I want to show is, again, uh, very briefly, uh, a few minutes a summary of a research project in the UK. Um, again, another example of uh, international research work which has been done around the OER University concept. And I, I promised Gabby Woodhouse from the University of Leicester um, that I would do this introduction because she, uh, she's very keen uh, to interview a number of us in this project to help inform uh, the future. So, um, technology learning. Technology learning. Hi everybody, and um, thank you so much to Wayne for inviting me to, to speak to you at this meeting. Um, my Hi everybody, and um, thank you so much to Wayne for inviting me to meet Hi everybody, and um, thank you so much to Wayne for inviting me to meet, to speak to you at this meeting. Um, my name is Gabby Wittas. I'm a research fellow at the University of Leicester. I'm based in the Beyond Distance Research Alliance, and I'm going to be telling you today about the project um, that I'm working on at the moment called Toucans. More about that in a minute. Toucans is um, supported by the SCORE program with the Open University and funded by the Higher Education Funding Council for England. The Toucans project is all about testing the OERU concept and aspirations within the UK. So it's a national study aimed at finding out how stakeholders in UK higher education feel and think about the concept of the OERU um, and hopefully will also generate some guidelines and frameworks for institutions in the UK that are considering joining the OER 10 network. So the, the questions, the main research questions are around the models and frameworks that OER Tertiary Education Network members are using or planning to use in their participation in the OER University in two specific areas. Firstly, in terms of accreditation of recognition of accreditation from other institutions. So if students um, gather credits from other universities and then come to your institution, how will your institution deal with recognizing those previously acquired credits? And secondly, in the area of student support, how and whether institutions that are participating in the OERU are planning to support their students. Um, those two questions will lead, um, I think, to some kind of an answer to the $500 million question, which is um, what is the business model that enables institutions to participate in this um, this great initiative of making education freely available to people who wouldn't otherwise have access to it. Um, how can that be done in, in a way that, um, that works from a business point of view? So um, once I've gathered some data from existing OER 10 members around these questions, I'll be liaising with stakeholders in UK universities, finding out what their attitudes and perceptions are and hopefully being able to give them some information gathered from existing members as to how the whole model could work. Um, I, here are my contact details, and 
I very much hope that all the signed up members of OER10 will be willing to make someone available for me to interview them, um, get some answers to these questions, share what they're thinking and how they're planning to, to make this work. Um, I do hope that this will ultimately further the cause of the OERU. Um, and I look forward to contact with all of you over the coming months. The project ends at the end of June 2012. I will be blogging and um, participating in all the debates and discussions online up until then. Thank you very much. Me to, me to speak to you at this meeting. Um, my name is Gabby Wittas. I'm a research fellow at the University of Leicester. Final slot and uh, tomorrow morning's discussions and so on and again there will be a handout for this so I'm going to distribute this at the end so I'll just say you need to make too much in the way of uh, copies and so on I'll take notes and that's will help keep you away. Um, so this is starting to look at the prototype and parameters for the prototype and again because we've got some new partners um, I just wanted to alert you a little bit to the sequence. This was the original concept and as we're aware today at each level there are challenges and complexities. So we talk about learners accessing courses based solely on OER, the support from academic volunteers international, I'll talk about briefly, and open assessment and then created all the things that we've been into today and that concept was translated into a Hewlett Foundation logic model and each element of these is designed in a sense so uh, it's like a jigsaw but if we can get a, a group working on open curriculum and another on credentialing and assessment we should be able to fit the pieces together and, and share and uh, manage the development of the operation. So the aim of this session is laying the foundation that we hope by the end of the meeting to allocate teams, possibly team leaders or institutional leadership, to the development of essential components that will enable us to run a prototype next year sometime. And as part of allocation, we of course need to devise governance and management structures for the development of an open project plan. So again, the wiki, all of that transparency and openness is a part of what we do. In setting up the teams, we hope that everyone will have no more than one degree of separation, so that each institution will be contributing to each element of the logic model by at least having a contact. But there might be a group of three who are making things happen and replace the foundation for pedagogy, curriculum, or whatever. So what I'm suggesting here are some, of, uh, some ideas that we will help us, I think, move quickly to a prototype. So running the subjects on the Moodle platform, on the Wiki Educator, I think is a way of extracting it away from the licensing issues that we face. And guaranteeing initial cross-credit is an important element, so we need to do some proactive work there to say who credit is, what, is it, what makes sense, using existing institutional processes. But if we need new policies or processes, then I'm suggesting that we work collaboratively and put it through a process within each institution. So we can save energy if we need new policies. <coughs> The next layer up is the academic volunteers in the national and that um, 
URL and that the microchip, the domain is already, we've had that for a couple of years, it is available. And I'll just explain briefly what we thought about recruiting uh, people on an honor system. And again, we're not going to discuss this today, but just something to think about is that if we started with a group like this in the room and we knew someone that we trusted absolutely to work in a particular course, we'd say, well, <coughs> I recommend Fred, and Fred will do this, and he'll sign up, whatever, brilliant we had. And then we gradually, you know, make that a sort of viral honor system, if you like. Because obviously we're going to get a range of people that might cause problems in the volunteering, we haven't really got the time to go through a selection process. So we need some system like an honor system uh, that's been used in a, a number of other environments that could work. We need a training program to encourage this culturally sensitive e-moderating and support. And we need logistical parameters. Now, that will depend on the pedagogy you know, Wayne might be able to run 10,000 on his own. I would like to tackle that. It depends on the pedagogy. So what I'm suggesting is, and again, looking at what's acceptable in the environment, is that we might say, if we have some interaction on a 1 to 25 basis, that's reasonable. Now, I know we can go much higher than that and still have a meaningful interaction. But we're going to be under a lot of uh, critical scrutiny under the spotlight. So we need something that's acceptable. Again, that's my personal view. The other view that I had was that we need a number of volunteers for each group working. So that the, there might be, say, four in an ideal world. So they might have a system where they log on every four days. They do half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever it is each. So it's rotated through, depending on the pedagogy, and that we have some standards for student support interactions about how we manage that, some guidelines. Now that's a big chunk on its own, um, but it needs to be done. We need something there to, to make this model you know, come to life. The other thing that I'm suggesting is that we manage the scale of the prototype. So I've suggested in this document, I'm going to hand rain in a moment, that we might look at three subjects in the prototype. Now it could be more, but I think more than one is essential. And I'm suggesting that we maybe run 100 students per course. Now that's not very ambitious, and I'm open to suggesting about what else might happen. But I'm also aiming to make sure that when we do this, we don't have major catastrophes in the proof of concept trial. And I've therefore suggested that we provide scholarships uh, for a, a limited number to pay for the assessment. We need to manage that somehow. And then we establish the actual cost recovery service fee based on collection of data around the institution. So we do some activity-based costing because there are complexities there across institutional process. And ultimately, the business model is cost recovery, in a sense. It's that no new money cost in theory, hopefully in practice. The other thing, uh, the last few slides here I've put together is that I feel that we need to do an evaluation starting more or less right now. Now, some of you would be familiar with the SIP evaluation model, which has been around for many years. Uh, I'm just going to run through how I think it will apply here. So the context, input, process, and product. Starting right now with context and input evaluations um, so that we can refine the processes. And I think this is a decision facilitation evaluation model for people who've got that background. And I think it lends itself pretty well. And the, the thing that we saw already started on the wiki about concerns and issues in particular context is essentially a, a context evaluation. But we need to systematize the input. We, we, my view is we need to collate that into some more coherent list of issues and, and activities. 
Similarly with the input evaluation, which is deciding what we're going to put on the table, which courses, how many volunteers, how many scholarships, how we're going to have so all of these inputs to make the process work. Uh, we need to start collecting data on that and collating it across context. So we have a, an OERU framework. So I believe they can start right away, but if we get the thing off the ground, we then do a, a process evaluation, which would be actually documenting and assessing and monitoring what actually happens. You know, what the students do, where they come from, how many of them stay with us, how many drop out, what are the issues, what are the problems. <coughs> and the product evaluation, since its first iteration of SIP, has thrown up into four products. The first one is the impact on the stakeholders, on the, the target audience in that sense, the students. So we're very keen to know about that. That's our, our main focus and purpose. But then we have uh, this is from Dan Stuffelby and Egon Gruber, some of you may have heard of him many years ago, but uh, this work evolved. So the other three products, again, I think, lend themselves to this project that we're working on. And the effectiveness evaluation, the sustainability evaluation, and the transportability evaluation. And my belief is that we need to get going on this more or less right away and um, to have a representative from each anger partner involved in this but having a small core team uh, who would actually generate you know, the frameworks, the questions, the interviews, the collation of data and so on. And, um, within USQ we've actually put in an internal research grant and David Poole, who hasn't had an opportunity to contribute, but we've also got Dr. Angela Murphy from Hardfield of Digital Futures Institute, who's dead keen to get started on this and would be our representative in the team. And uh, she's, she's sufficiently allocated time to get started if we want to make this happen quickly. So that's a, a contribution you know, from us. So my recommendation is that we start work on the context, which we elaborate what we've already got, and the input evaluations, which will follow up from decisions made here. Um, and we develop um, a project plan to do this. So it's essential that we have a project plan for the prototype, and this will feed it. And then we might have a master project plan that can start operating together. So this logic model becomes a sort of reality. They can help you reflect overnight. I've put up here eight proposals for action which underpin the prototype. Now there's probably other things, but I've concentrated on the operational essentials if you like. And the activity-based costing and the like will lay the foundation for the business model. So in a sense, the logic model, you know, ideally would have a, a team working on some component of it, a group working to explore the business model, the infrastructure, open student administration, which we talked about this morning. But the eight points that I've got on this handout of things that are going to enable us to get started next year and run a proof of concept prototype. And they're really just a draft for discussion. It's just a way to give a focus for our thinking, um, possibly overnight and certainly tomorrow morning when we break up. And I believe there are some natural groupings of the eight activities, so we won't necessarily need eight groups but I think it's something to start thinking about. If we want to run a prototype next year, then I believe we've got to get started pretty much right away or as soon as we can. And the final thing, tomorrow I think we should set a date for 2013 when we may be able to expand the offering beyond the prototype and have a project management team starting to look at that. So we made the point, I think, it was made this morning that the concept looks simple, but the actual implementation is challenging. 
Having said that, I think it's also feasible and viable if we use the experience around the table and we enter into it in the spirit of openness and transparency and collaboration. So I think it is feasible, but it's still not easy. Thank you very much, Jim. Any questions of clarity? Um, you know, a pressing issue now. So the thinking is, this is just a bit of you know, some food for thought for thinking about how we structure and divide ourselves tomorrow morning. And these are really suggestions on the table around how we might divide into subgroups. So you can have a think about that. Because first thing tomorrow, we'll actually have a look and see, what well, do these groups make sense uh, from our own perspective and figure out how we can divide ourselves to actually start planning the implementation of the prototype. Makes sense. Any questions of clarity? Um, anything that wasn't uh, clear? Nikki, yeah. yes. Could it be possible to use the same course at different levels in different institutions? So for example, what I'm really saying here is if we decided, I could get the buy in and all the rest of it, um, to take that course that you were showing us, but put it in to not a degree program, but in preparation for university study, it would be at a different level. Would that be counterproductive to our principles? I, I don't, I think it's a question of pedagogical design, whether it's concentric uh, or, or not. Um, and that's where qualification frameworks help us. Um, and so it's something that is at, say, a lower level, and this was the levels we were talking about earlier in the 5, 6, 7 in the New Zealand system. So it would be problematic at that level. So it was, if it was kind of level 4, and it's you know, level 5 credentials somewhere else, it, there are issues. But, I mean, a qualifications framework addresses that. Um, but by the same token, the whole notion of reuse uh, is very powerful because, I mean, we know a number of disciplines that you know we keep revisiting the same themes, but just you know, the level of complexity evolves. Yeah, and then which is Any other other questions? Okay. Good. I I, can't, I know it's been a very long day, and I know many of us, or many of you, not us, have travelled long distances to be on the jet lag. Must be kicking <coughs> in now, big time. So thank you very, very much for uh, you know, your attention right after, you know, to the last minute of a long day. And I also want to thank our, our online uh, participants in IC. We've had colleagues in the UK, I mean, Gabby herself was up at 3 a.m. <laughs> you know, participating in what's happening here. You know, uh, David Porter, I see, you know, Chief Executive of BC Campus, he's, you know, in engaging in the whole process. So, a number of people internationally watching what we're doing, and it's just great that we can collaboratively as an open uh, movement, you know, work together to, uh, to create a better life for all. So, thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>